Assalamu alaikum rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, my name is Dr. Jamila bin Adi. I'm a consultant of internal medicine. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to be chairing the session tonight uh, about the effective VTE management and the role of edoxaban in advancing anticoagulation. Uh, our we are going to, we are having two eminent speakers tonight. We will start by uh, the first, our first speaker, Dr. Uh, Professor Jan Steffel, who's a chairperson and professor of cardiology at the University of Zurich. And he's a senior consultant in invasive electrophysiology and cardiac devices. Uh, Dr. Steffel is going to talk to us about the effective VTE management and the role of edoxaban in advancing anticoagulation. So welcome, Dr. Stefan. Thank you very much for, uh, for having me. It's a great pleasure. Thank you. I will start sharing my presentation. And um, thank you again for having me. Uh, this is really a great. I love to be um, with uh, you and the group uh, down in UAE. And um, I've just been there a couple of weeks ago, and it was great to see everybody again face to face. So, uh, and I'm looking forward to my next time uh, uh, down there. Um, today, we'll talk about anticoagulation again, but we'll focus this time, as indicated by Dr. Jamila, more on the um, VTE management. Uh, these are my disclosures. And I should also mention that I was involved, or I am involved, in the edoxaban trial for atrial fibrillation and stroke prevention, the Engage AF trial. Uh, but today, we'll talk more on VTE, as indicated. However, the drugs are the same. And um, therefore, I will start by mentioning our ERA practical guide for the use of a novel or direct anticoagulants. Um, because in this guide, we do also talk a little bit about VTE. Or put the other way around, it turns out now, over 10 years into the NOAC era, that many things that we knew or that we know for, uh, for stroke prevention, atrial fibrillation, actually also holds true uh, for VTE. But there are some important differences. And when we take a look at the different drugs, the, the four NOACs that are available, and their dosing regimens um, for the treatment of venous thromboembolism, you can see that there are certain differences regarding the initial therapy. Apixaban and Revoroxaban were studied to be taken directly, uh, whereas the bigotrin and edoxaban had at least a couple of days um, with heparin, a low molecular weight heparin run in. And we will touch on this uh, later uh, to see whether this makes sense or not, and in which patients it may be um, necessary. The remainder of the treatment phase then used a different dose of the drug in those that started um, initially with the NOAC. And um, for the others, there was a fixed dose. However, edoxaban is the only NOAC which has actually been tested for VTE treatment in a reduced dose. There is no reduced dose of apixaban um, or for a rivaroxaban. Those were tested in the treatment phase only with one fixed dose, whereas for edoxaban, the same dose reduction criteria are valid or can be applied that, uh, also, that are also uh, used for stroke prevention in atrial fibrillation. So creatinine clearance less than 50, body weight less than 60, or concomitant therapy with a strong PGP inhibitor. And indeed, uh, this is based on the largest single NOAC VTE treatment trial, the Hoxi VTE trial, in which edoxaban was compared to warfarin in patients with symptomatic and confirmed venous thromboembolism. Now, these patients were stratified according to certain criteria, and we will touch on those later on. But you can see that this was almost 8,300 patients randomized into the two arms. As an exclusion criterion, they had to present with an acute symptomatic event, um, either venous thromboembolism or um, pulmonary embolism. And as indicated, the dose reduction criteria were exactly the same 
as in the um, Engage AF trial for stroke prevention in atrial fibrillation. And that is that these patients uh, underwent a dose reduction, both at trial entry, as well as during the study, which is quite unique, which even in stroke prevention has not been performed with any other drug. And in VTE, as indicated, edoxaban was the only, and still is the only NOAC, which has been studied to be dose reduced according to these criteria. So this really gives us a very nice way of individualizing therapy. Now, if we take a look at the um, uh, patients that were included in the HOXI VTE trial, you can see that the median age of these patients is by far younger than what we have seen for, uh, for stroke prevention and atrial fibrillation. About 15 to 20 years younger, really, um, in, the, in their mid-50s which also will explain some of the outcomes, as you will see later on. Um, you can also see that uh, the majority of pay people are healthier, as you would expect, because they're substantially younger than in uh, atrial fibrillation patients. You can see that um, the causes of DVT and pulmonary embolism are kind of what you would expect in an, in an all-comer population. Um, about two-thirds were unprovoked, 28% um, with a transient risk factor, and almost 20% were recurrent events. Um, there were very few patients with cancer enrolled in this uh, trial, which um, is normal because these patients were actually tried to be excluded. Um, uh, however, and as you will see later on, there is now a dedicated cancer trial, the Hox IVT cancer trial, also a very large trial, which has looked at these patients specifically. Now, you can see here the outcomes of the trial, and you will see the overall cohort as well as the on-treatment cohort. Now, this is for the efficacy outcome, recurrent VTE. And... Um, I will come to the separation between on treatment and overall cohort later on. This has to do with the treatment duration of patients. So if you want to take a look at the way the outcome was, how patients were initially um, uh, were initially stratified or, or treated, you can see here that there is a clear um, non-inferiority of edoxaban over warfarin um, across the duration of the trial. So this is really good news. It's clearly non-inferior. And if you take a look at um, this in a, in a forest plot, you will see this, that both in the overall study uh, period as well as in the on-treatment period, there's a uh, highly significant non-inferiority. And in fact, the point estimate is even on the side favoring um, edoxaban. Um, of course, we also need to take a look at the flip side, and that's major bleeding. And then the good news here is that also for major bleeding, um, this uh, looks very nice visually. And in this situation, there was even significance for superiority. So there was clearly less bleeding with edoxaban as compared to warfarin. So similar, if not better, efficacy, and at the same time, improved safety. So and this is really good news. Now, if you take a look at this in a bit more detail, you can see that this is relevant. This is an almost 2% absolute risk reduction. So a number needed to treat of only 50 in order to prevent a major bleeding. You can see that these are, um, uh, as I said, healthier patients than, uh, than uh, AFib patients. So you will see that major bleedings were not so common. Clinically relevant major bleed, non-major bleedings, however, were rather common, and there was a very nice reduction in those. Um, and again, in, in the major bleedings, there were really very, very few events overall, and with edoxaban, a really superb outcome. Now, let's take a little bit of a look at some of the subgroups, and I will touch on some other subgroups later on in a little bit more detail. But to make a long story short, there wasn't really a single subgroup that ended up completely on the wrong side of the line of unity. That's a very important takeaway. So essentially, all patients benefited. There seemed to be certain populations that might benefit even more. As you can see here, there's a trend towards an interaction that older patients seem to benefit even more regarding efficacy. Um, 
And there is also, um, there was also a signal that fragile patients seem to benefit more in terms of efficacy from edoxaban than from warfarin. Now, that of course would not mean that we would treat a non-fragile patient then with warfarin, but I guess the main message from this is that there is no need to shy away from using the drug edoxaban, even in older patients and in more frail patients. If anything, they might have an even better outcome. Um, we can also see that the uh, results were independent of the center level INR control. So also patients or centers with a good INR control, actually there was a benefit in terms of, um, there was non-inferiority in terms of uh, recurrence of events. And even in those patients, there was a benefit in terms of me, uh, me, um, clinically relevant major bleeding. Although um, the benefit was less pronounced, even in those patients, there was a benefit. So that's good. It's also interesting, the investigators also took a look at um, what the outcome was depending on how many days uh, at or after randomization these patients were treated with heparin prior to edoxaban being started. And it's quite interesting that there was absolutely no difference in outcomes depending on how long these patients were treated with heparin beforehand. And I think this is quite an important outcome for all practical purposes. Because to be honest, I think in patients with a moderate or a severe type of DVT or PE actually more, um, uh, and uh, Dr. Tariq will touch on some of those later on, um, I think it is anyways mandatory to start these patients on heparin because you never know what's going to happen. You never know how stable they will remain. You never know if they need to undergo a catheter directed thrombolysis or any other invasive procedures. So you wouldn't start edoxaban anyways in these patients. But even in patients that only receive very few doses of low molecular heparins, um, even those patients had a benefit. So in the lower risk patients, this is not so much of an issue, really. I think this is something that is sometimes a little bit, um, I feel a little bit blown out of proportion. Now, let's take a look at the patients with dose reduction, because that's quite interesting. Um, as you can tell here, there were a couple of hundred patients that received the reduced dose of etoxaban, 30 milligrams. And this was um, in, in this situation, interestingly, mainly because of reduced body weight, not so much because of reduced kidney function. In, AFib, in the AFib trial, it was just the other way around. It was mainly because of reduced kidney function. And then some patients had um, uh, PGP inhibitors, strong PGP inhibitors. Now, if we take a look at the outcomes, and that's quite important, if we take a look at the outcomes based on whether they received the reduced dose or the normal dose, you'll see that the outcomes were exactly the same, both for efficacy as well as for safety. So the efficacy and safety of 60 and 30 milligrams of edoxaban in the respective patient populations is exactly the same. And this is in contrast to warfarin. Because if you take a look at patients on warfarin, I mean, they all have the same uh, target INR, right? Two to three. But if you took a look at now patients that would have that would have qualified for a dose reduction for edoxaban, uh, but were on warfarin, so patients with reduced kidney function, low body weight patients, and so on, they had a similar outcome in terms of efficacy, but they had a much worse outcome in terms of safety. So they had a higher bleeding risk. And that's interesting because this explains some of the um, results that we will see in just a minute. Now, it, because if you take a look at now uh, the reduced dose versus warfarin, there was um, clearly a superiority in terms of uh, the, um, the, the safety events as compared to warfarin. And if you compare the two, the benefit was even larger in the reduced dose patients than in the normal dose patients. So again, pointing to what I was saying earlier, that especially in the frail elderly patients, the sicker patients, we should not shy away from using a safe and effective NOAC, such as edoxaban, um, to treat these patients. Because sometimes we kind of feel that, yeah, it's maybe not the right patient, maybe we stick to what we know. These patients actually benefit even more 
It's not that the others don't benefit, but these patients benefit even more. And in terms of efficacy, there was, again, absolutely no problem. So the 30 milligrams in those patients that qualify for dose reduction is enough. It's enough drug in order to be as efficacious as warfarin, but you're a lot safer. So really a good choice. Now, coming back to the four NOACs, I think it's very important, and this is, again, a concept that we've been dealing with in atrial fibrillation for the longest time, that is that um, not all of the NOACs are created equal. They are important differences. And um, it starts at seemingly simple things like bioavailability. Now, there are big differences in terms of the bioavailability of these drugs. Uh, Rivaroxaban, for example, has a bioavailability of about 100%, up to 100%. However, it has that only when you take it with food. That's very important. And we're talking about a good amount of food. So this needs to be a good size American type breakfast. Um, so if you or your patients only have like, I don't know, a small yogurt or whatever for breakfast, that is not enough. The, the background to this is that edoxaban needs a certain time in the stomach in order to be cracked up and in order to be resorbed afterwards. So if your patients don't take a good meal uh, while taking the drug, then uh, it just rushes through the stomach too quickly. And as a result of that, you will have a substantially reduced plasma level. Uh, up to one third reduction. So definitely, if people don't eat a good sized breakfast, they need to take Rivaroxaban at another different time point during the day. Or they need to be on a different NOAC because we have actually not seen this dependency on food with any of the other drugs. Uh, renal clearance is another important differentiator, as we all know. Um, and then one thing that is frequently overlooked, actually, is CYP3A4 metabolism. Because uh, this is obviously um, an isoenzyme of the P450 complex in the liver, which, uh, which is involved in the metabolism of a lot of drugs. And we can see that it is not involved in the metabolism of the bigotran, and it's only minimally involved in the metabolism of edoxaban. Whereas it is involved to some degree for up to uh, with the Pixaban and with Rivaroxaban. And as a result of that, there are important um, um, implications regarding co-medications, because some of the co-medications may actually interfere with the NOAX and as a result of that, alter the level of NOAX. This is again from our ERA guide. There are, um, uh, there are about 15 pages to this uh, table. It's, it drags on forever. It's impossible to memorize all of this. Um, and it doesn't matter whether you use this or whether you use any online database or anything like that. Um, main thing is remember that there are differences. Remember that there are important interactions and do check for interactions, especially in the frail and elderly patient populations. Speaking of which, um, those patients were specifically looked at um, also in the HOXIVTE trial. And um, you can see that patients aged 65 or older or um, and at least two or more medical conditions uh, or more than five co-medications were separately grouped into the frail or elderly patient population for this trial. And you can see that also in this population, um, there was um, an even greater benefit actually of edoxaban over warfarin for recurrent VTE. And there was a very nice signal in terms of major bleeding. So again, and as indicated before, a very good patient population to be treated this way. Now, dose reduction we've already touched on. Um, and What's clear is that the drug is very safe, but I think what also becomes clear is that it is very effective. And of course, this is um, mostly shown in those patients that really need efficacy. And here, the antiprobian P level cutoff was used to see how much the right ventricle has suffered from those patients with a pulmonary embolism. And you can see that in patients with an elevated antiprobian P, so an early sign of um, uh, or, or a possible sign of RV dysfunction in this setting, uh, the benefit of edoxaban over warfarin tended to be even bigger. So also these patients, and particularly these patients, actually benefit from the drug. Uh, 
So for all practical purposes, that means that if such a patient comes in, uh, I would always put that patient on a heparin uh, drip because you never know in which direction it falls. But if it goes well, if there's no lysis necessary, if there's no catheter-directed thrombolysis necessary, then switching these patients over to uh, edoxaban might be um, a good idea. Of course, there's also the other end of the spectrum, and that's those patients that do not require, do not necessarily require inpatient therapy. And in a large trial like this, again, almost 8,300 patients included, uh, there are always um, a couple of patients that were not hospitalized. And you can see this was seven to 600 patients in each arm. So a good size evidence also for patients uh, on outpatient or an outpatient basis. And you can see here the comparison of outpatient versus hospitalized. And you can see that there is no significant p-value for interaction, indicating that both patient populations actually benefit uh, in terms of efficacy, uh, both those with an outpatient as well as those that were uh, hospitalized. And in fact, both in the DVT and in the PE arm. So this worked in both patient populations. What's interesting is that um, in terms of safety, uh, for the DVT, there was absolutely no problem. But in patients with PE, with pulmonary embolism, it was quite interesting that actually there seemed to be, although this was not statistically significant, but at least visually there seemed to be a signal for an increase in bleeding. Now, again, this is not significant, but again, I think it goes in the direction of what I was saying earlier. Um, we must not underestimate uh, venous thromboembolism. Uh, we know that for many DVTs, there's also clinically not visible pulmonary embolism. Uh, we know that for almost every pulmonary embolism, there is or there was a deep vein thrombosis. And so, um, you know, when, whenever it's possible to treat these patients on an outpatient basis, it's okay. But if not, it's absolutely not a luxury to keep these patients as inpatients and then also to treat them with heparin first, because in many of those, you don't really know in which direction things may fall. Now, regarding long-term treatment, um, there have been some changes over the last couple of years, also in the guidelines, regarding how we view the risk of a, of a, of a thromboembolic event of a VTE. Because in the past, we used to have this dichotomy of provoked versus unprovoked, as it was also here because the trial was conducted before this. Um, but the guidelines based on, on, on study data are going away from this concept a little bit and more towards uh, estimating the long-term risk for recurrence. This is how the ESC guidelines do it, for example, into low, intermediate, or high depending on the risk factor category for the index event, right? So if the index event was caused by a major or occurred in the presence of a major transient or reversible factor that's associated with a tenfold increased risk, like, for example, surgery with general anesthesia, uh, people being bedbound for a while, trauma with fractures, then there is a low risk less than 3%, which is still not zero, but less than 3% per year for a long-term recurrence. Whereas this um, gets uh, uh, larger, uh, this risk, um, as patients move into higher risk categories. And based on this, we have different recommendation regarding the long-term anticoagulation. Uh, you can see that in the uh, green ones, um, oral anticoagulation is recommended for at least three months and then uh, usually discontinued and only to a C indication for extension of oral anticoagulation if minor transient risk factors um, were or are present and, of course, after assessing the bleeding risk. Whereas in the uh, first episode of a PE without an identifiable risk factor or in recurrent VTE, Usually, this means indefinite um, uh, duration or anticoagulation. And in this regard, it's important to realize that also in the HOX-IVTE trial, patients were treated long term, because frequently the conception is that uh, there is no long term data for edoxaban for stroke pre uh, for um, for uh, VTE secondary VTE prevention. But ultimately, once when 
the treatment phase ends and when secondary prevention starts tends to be a bit of an arbitrary situation. Um, uh, three months, six months, nine months. So in Hoxi VTE, as you can tell, there were actually over 3,000 patients that received that therapy for 12 months, which is a long time. Uh, whereas the remainder of the um, uh, study population receives it for a shorter period of time. And this explains the differences between those curves that we saw in the beginning. Because those patients that you can see here, those arms that are starting to climb again after three months, after six months, these are the patients that had their study uh, drug for three or six months. So normally, naturally, they will increase their risk of recurrent events once the, um, the drug is stopped. We do know that there is a risk of recurrent events. Whereas what you can see below here is the event rate, the curve for patients who were treated for half a year or longer, up to 12 months. And you can see that the effect is sustained of edoxaban. There is no late crossover. So this is, um, this is very good news. So the drug actually also works um, over time. Of course, when we take a look at the bleeding events, the majority of bleeding events always happen in the first couple of uh, weeks to months. That's normal. Once somebody has sustained three months of therapy, there is a good chance that the person will also um, not have a severe bleeding afterwards. And this is true both on warfarin and onidoxaban. However, the risk with warfarin, of course, is a lot higher. Uh, but afterwards, then the risk of major bleeding is really low in both patient populations. Um, when we take a look at the uh, bleeding uh, during extended treatment periods, um, you can see this here quite nicely. When you go, uh, when you cut kind of the graph at three months and put everything back to zero, then there is no difference in major bleeding. However, we must not forget that before that, there is a substantial difference. And this is kind of the survivor bias that we see here. Once they have uh, survived their uh, bleeding events, then there is no further increase. Um, and this is also shown here again in the first plot. So when we put this into perspective, this is kind of what we have in terms of data for secondary prevention. As indicated, edoxaban with the pre-specified dose reduction criteria was tested up to 12 months. The bigotran was tested up to three years. So that's actually the longest. But for rivaroxaban and for apixaban, the long-term data are actually quite similar to what we have seen uh, with edoxaban. So the evidence base ultimately is actually quite similar regarding long-term prevention amongst the 10A inhibitors. And at the end, I would like to briefly shift gears then into the, well, probably the most severe or the most um, high risk patient population for VTE, and that is uh, cancer patients. So um, these were, as indicated before, pretty much excluded in the Hoxi uh, VTE trial, uh, but were specifically studied in the Hoxi VTE cancer trial. So in this, in this trial, in fact, it was a prerequisite that you would have a cancer and a thromboembolic event, and then you were randomized to either receive, again, edoxaban, again, with the same dose reduction criteria, um, or uh, daltaparin. So not warfarin, but uh, low molecular weight heparin, uh, as this is kind of the therapy of choice in patients with um, tumor-related uh, venous thromboembolic disease. And um, you can see that, again, the patient population is a bit older than before, but still um, not as old as your typical AFib patient population. And of course, per definition, the majority has active cancer, almost all of them have active cancer, and over half of them have metastatic disease. So this was really a sick patient population. And as a result of that, you can see that the primary outcome, so a recurrent venous thromboembolism or major bleeding actually occurred over one year in almost 12 to 13% of patients. And there was no difference with edoxaban over daltaparin uh, in the combined uh, endpoint of efficacy and safety. Now, when you pull these two apart and take a look at them separately, it's actually quite interesting because in terms of efficacy, edoxaban was better than daltaparin, was better than daltaparin in the prevention of a recurrent venous thromboembolism. While 
If the combination ends up the same, then that would mean that indeed there was a signal for an increase in major bleeding with edoxaban in these patients. But there are two important, very important um, uh, aspects to this. Number one, the type of major bleeding that was increased was really category two major bleedings. So the non-severe major bleedings, those we saw more with edoxaban than with daltoparin. And the other thing for all practical purposes that's extremely important is that this was exclusively confined to patients with a GI cancer. In GI cancer, there was an increased risk of major bleeding, whereas in non-GI cancer patients, there was absolutely no difference. And pathophysiologically, this makes sense. If you have an active GI cancer and you, you take a pill that is active in the gut, because this does not need to be activated, right? It's an active ingredient. Then um, this will pass by the spot where there is um, a potential bleeding or an occult bleeding and which may transform this into an active bleeding. Whereas daltoparin, of course, is low molecular weight heparin, and it doesn't make anything locally. So that's why, for all practical purposes, in cancer patients, I personally would recommend against using any NOAC um, in patients with active GI cancer. Now, of course, if this is an, a, a remote GI cancer, or if the can gastric cancer has been solved or treated, and they then have a VTE, I would not have a problem treating them also with a, a NOAC or with edoxaban, but an active GI cancer, I would recommend against it. It makes no sense pathophysiologically, and we actually have a lot of patients that we can still treat um, uh, if, we, if we take out the active GI cancer patients. So uh, in summary and take home, dear uh, Ms. Chairman and uh, dear colleagues uh, that are listening and watching, I think pretty clear for the treatment and for the long-term treatment of VTE, NOAX are nowadays the standard of care. Um, this has been as much of a shift as it has been in stroke prevention for atrial fibrillation. In the HOXA VTE trial, we've seen in the largest single study in VTE treatment um, that edoxaban has similar efficacy and superior safety over vitamin K antagonists up to 12 months of therapy including also long-term prevention, because again, this is somewhat arbitrary where the one ends and the other starts. This is very similar across subgroups. And that's very important, again, also from a conceptual point of view that both high-risk and low-risk uh, pulmonary embolism patients benefit the same, as well as the older and the elderly and the frail patients. Um, in the HOX-IVTE cancer trial, we've seen fewer thromboembolic events with edoxaban. We have seen more bleedings, um, but this was confined exclusively to active GI cancer patients. In non-GI cancer patients, there was no difference in bleeding. And this is why also in this patient population, edoxaban may be a good choice. And in fact, it's the only NOAC with studied dose reduction criteria, even for the treatment phase of VTE, which in my eyes is quite an elegant way of individualizing therapy because you can really tailor this to your patients in an evidence-based fashion. You don't need to be off-label. You can use it in an evidence-based fashion once daily. I think this is a very good option that we have at hand here. And with this, I would like to finish. I thank you all very much for your attention and uh, I'm looking forward later on then to the Q&A. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Stefel, uh, for this very informative lecture. Uh, and um, before we move to the next lecture, I would just uh, a small message to the our doctors. Uh, please, if you have any question, query, uh, please post it in the Q and A uh, part of the uh, bar below in your uh, uh, screen and uh, keep all the questions and uh, discussion till the end of the second part of our uh, scientific event tonight. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Tarek Bakri, who is a consultant in internal medicine and a chairman of the anticoagulation task force committee in Sheikh Khalifa Medical City Hospital in Abu Dhabi, UAE.
Dr. Tarık is going to talk to us, uh, present to us clinical cases of VTE. So welcome, Dr. Tarık. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Jamila, for the nice introduction. And thank you, uh, Professor uh, Stefal, for very, very informative uh, uh, presentation. So today, uh, and thank you for all the attendees uh, uh, who's listening uh, to this uh, education session. So uh, I'm gonna present a couple of cases, uh, illustrate uh, what uh, Professor uh, Stefal mentioned. Uh, so we will uh, reflect it in practice. Uh, so I will start with the same slide similar to uh, uh, Professor. Uh, basically nowadays, uh, NUAC is, as we said, is a standard of care. Uh, but and we have multiple medication to choose from, which is always uh, nice to have multiple op option. So we can uh, pick and choose according to our patient profile and our about uh, uh, also go with our patient preference. So we have a uh, uh, very nice uh, uh, medication. All of them really work very well. But as the Professor mentioned, there are a few changes or a few uh, differences where it might help us in our practice to choose one uh, from the other. Uh, and I put on the right side some uh, properties of the NUA, which really I do it on regular basis uh, uh, in our discussion uh, with our colleague and also with the patient before I decide which NUA to give. So I don't go and enter the room and, and I have something in mind. I will, uh, you know, I will uh, talk to the patient and then decide according to the patient profile. So one of them, as we said, once a day versus twice a day. Uh, for us as a physician, sometimes we don't believe there is big difference, but uh, according to the patient, really it makes very difference because compliance is very important. So for me, once a day is advantage uh, uh, on the top of other advantages. Uh, a professor mentioned about uh, food with or without. It's very, very important. And we had a few cases uh, where uh, there was some issue with, in particular, rivaroxaban. So nowadays, it's a must uh, from the physician part, from the pharmacist part, uh, to always mention uh, uh, people uh, the, to the patient who's going to go on rivaroxaban to take it with the heaviest meal uh, and to take large amount, as Professor said. Uh, this is underestimated, uh, and actually, we don't do good education, but we should. Uh, cost is very also important, uh, uh, especially for some patient who doesn't have insurance or doesn't have very good coverage. Uh, uh, so uh, initially, before we really introduce edoxaban, we had some cases where we couldn't give NUAC because of the cost. And uh, uh, for credit for edoxaban uh, was less uh, expensive than the other and as good as the other. Uh, we're utilizing it more and more in our practice uh, uh, nowadays. Uh, also, drug-drug interaction, which I've already mentioned, reduce those as part of the trial. This is very important, uh, so we can individualize to a, a patient profile. Uh, and we have a, a, a evidence base. Uh, it's not just like recommendation. Uh, severity of the VTE is very important, as Professor said. Sometimes we really need to uh, initially tell we know uh, what the situation of the patient, where is he going. Uh, we're talking about either extensive uh, uh, DVT or PE, uh, you know, submassive or massive, where we really need uh, most of the time to start with heparin uh, or enoxaparin. Then we will uh, go from there. For those patients with low risk, uh, especially PE, uh, in our practice, uh, most of them, they get ad admitted for 24 hours, then usually can go home. And most of the time, uh, regardless if we're going to use rivaroxaban uh, or abexaban with a loading dose or not, or edoxaban with enoxaparin, uh, because there is a little, a little bit of also uh, some hesitance from uh, a physician where like, you know, they say, oh, I would go with this more than uh, that because I have to give five days of enoxaparin. But in our practice, honestly, uh, uh, it's not a major issue. It's similar to what we used to do with warfarin, where we used to give them enoxaparin for five days till the INR gets therapeutic. So this is not really uh, 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 something to uh, 
prevent the patient of the other benefit uh, of adoxapan. And we had many patients who will get uh, discharge, especially for DVT from the ER, uh, uh, with enoxaparin for five days and tells them to go to adoxapan. Or if the decision to go with rivaroxaban, adoxapan, to go the loading dose and uh, go from there. But always remember, um, too much changes in dosage, uh, too much changes like, you know, one week here, three weeks here. Uh, be careful with compliance, be careful uh, with, uh, with the patient understanding because we had multiple issue uh, and we had multiple patient coming back with recurrent DVT and VTE or uh, problem. Uh, uh, with confusion of dosage. So sometimes simple dose uh, is, is very also important. Uh, and on as we said, real lung function like edoxaban is not recommended to, to give with uh, creatinine clearance less than 30. Rivaroxaban, abexaban, we can go down to 15. But anytime we use NUAC uh, with creatinine clearance than, less than 30, the risk of a bleed increase for any uh, of anticoagulation, even with heparin, even with uh, enoxaparin. And uh, as we said, uh, patient's uh, preference is very important. So we have him to be a uh, part of the decision. Sorry for the uh, sticking on that slide for a long time, but this is very important uh, to deliver to our colleagues and to deliver it to the patient. So we will decide what, which and what to, to use. So I will start with a, a clinical case. Uh, this uh, Mrs. Uh, S.A., she is 32 year old, healthy female, presented to our emergency room with history of mild to moderate uh, left pleuritic chest pain for three days. She had shortness of breath on exertion for about a week. Uh, before she had the shortness of breath, she also had a little bit of mild left leg pain for a day or two, then uh, uh, it went away. Uh, the patient continued to have shortness of breath then she had the chest pain and she came to the emergency room. Uh, she had delivery, vaginal uh, and complicated delivery about months ago uh, before coming uh, to the ER, and she had full uh, term uh, pregnancy and uh, without any complication. Uh, past medical history, as we said, she's healthy, no previous VTE. So it's very important to always, uh, when somebody comes with suspicion VTE or diagnosed with VTE, to review the uh, past medical history as a recurrence or not, and also family history. In her case, she didn't have any family history of VTE. Her father had diabetes. She's on iron supplement after pregnancy because of uh, uh, moderate anemia. Uh, when she got evaluated in the emergency room, you can see I put some uh, levels in red because that will be affect our uh, management uh, later on. So her heart rate, she was having sinus tachycardia, her blood pressure, not less than 90, so like 140 over 70, which is uh, fine. Respiratory rate, uh, she's tachypneic with rate of 32 and her O2 saturation, 88%. Uh, she had full history and physical, she had full evaluation. And uh, uh, one of the things was really on the top of the differential diagnosis to rule out PE, especially after uh, we did the WELS score. And then later on, uh, she had D-timer, which is positive. Uh, 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 the, uh, this, the, uh, we proceed with basically CTPA. So her chest X-ray uh, lung was, was unremarkable, but she had prominent, prominent congested uh, 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 both pulmonary hyla, uh, which retrospectively can go, you know, go with the PE. She has sinus tachycardia uh, on ECG. Uh, so her CTPA, if, uh, CTPA, as you see, uh, there was significant finding, uh, so, you know, confirming the diagnosis of her PE. So there was central PE starting at the right and uh, left main pulmonary artery extending into the uh, lower and uh, segmental branches of upper and lower lobes. Uh, there was also uh, 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 occlusive segmental PE in the posterior segment of the left lower lobe associated with focal pulmonary uh, infarction. And also uh, uh, there was some, some evidence of uh, uh, and uh, features of right heart uh, strain. Uh, later on after uh, admission, uh, it was, we did also venous Doppler uh, because she had history of uh, leg pain at the beginning, uh, 
to see if there is a associated DBT with it or not, although it's not gonna change the management uh, significantly. So uh, uh, as recommended now by the uh, guidelines, whenever we get PE patient, we have to do the pulmonary embolism severity index. And if we do it on this patient, she's uh, uh, getting 32 from her age, then we're adding 20 for uh, pulse above 110, uh, respiratory rate above 30 and uh, uh, O2 saturation less than 90. So her uh, PE uh, SI comes as 92 and she uh, it put her in the uh, level three, which is intermediate. And as you say, uh, as we see here, uh, it's very important to do the pulmonary embolism severity index for two reasons. One of them, it might affect the management as you will see in the next two slides and also as uh, uh, estimate for risk of 30-day mortality. The higher the level, the higher mortality. And as you see here in the uh, European Society of Cardiology, uh, uh, it's recommended even now when we have uh, a severity in this school uh, uh, at low, uh, uh, we really need to look for uh, right ventricle uh, dysfunction in the form of either uh, uh, echo or from the CT or uh, uh, biological markers like troponin and uh, uh, BMP. So this patient, basically her BMP troponin was fine. Uh, the CT showed feature of uh, uh, right ventricular dysfunction. And uh, as we said, it's very important to, to look for right ventricle dysfunction in the form of uh, echo or CTP and also to do the cardiac troponin level or BMP or both uh, because that will affect the level uh, of the patient. Even with low score, uh, if there is uh, uh, evidence of right ventricle dysfunction, it will put the patient at higher level, put him at uh, or her at higher uh, mortality and uh, it will affect the management uh, sometimes. Uh, her echo uh, done uh, uh, next day, uh, which showed mild tricuspid regard, uh, with, uh, moderate pulmonary artery hypertension, 50 to 55, no uh, pericardial effusion. Uh, so if we uh, follow the uh, uh, European Society of Cardiology, which is really nice one uh, in the treatment of PE. So the patient initially, because higher uh, uh, suspicion and low risk of a bleed, she was started on uh, enoxaparin uh, in the ER, then uh, uh, the, the admitting doctor uh, went through the algorithm. So this patient, because uh, she had right ventricle, uh, her score was uh, three, and also there is evidence of uh, right ventricle dysfunction of CTPA. Uh, 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 so she was uh, put in intermediate risk. Uh, and because her troponin and BMB was normal, so she's uh, categorized as intermediate uh, low risk. Uh, so the patient got admitted to the hospital. We continue uh, uh, enoxaparin uh, for two to three days. The patient continue to improve. Uh, her tachycardia got better. Uh, she was off oxygen in a couple of days. So uh, this is what the Professor uh, uh, Stefel was mentioning that some of those patients, when they come we don't know where uh, they are going, if they get better or not. So the, such patient, uh, it's very important to, to admit to the patient to start uh, heparin uh, and uh, later on decide uh, which new one to start. Uh, if some other cases we might start at lower risk, we might start new one right away. But in, in reality, those patients above low risk uh, needs to be started on enoxaparin or heparin initially, then we'll uh, go for it. So this patient, after getting better uh, on the third day, she was doing much better. Uh, we uh, discharged her home on edoxapan, uh, 60 milligram, because she doesn't uh, qualify for the reduced dose. And uh, the plan was to uh, basically continue uh, at least for uh, six months, uh, then reevaluate at six months regarding uh, extension or not. Uh, you know, this patient, uh, luckily, she did very well. Uh, but if you see, uh, she had right ventricular dysfunction and she had also uh, elevated, uh, sorry, uh, elevated pulmonary blood pressure. Uh, 
was most likely because of the uh, uh, PE, because he was a healthy person. So uh, some of those patients, uh, if they, especially like this patient, uh, if she has uh, elevated troponin or uh, BMP, uh, significant right ventricular dysfunction, uh, uh, there is uh, uh, what we call submassive uh, PE. Uh, there are sometimes some cases uh, with very low risk of bleed uh, uh, to consider uh, uh, using low dose uh, tr thrombolytic therapy. Uh, uh, of course, it's not for everybody, but something to really rem uh, to, to keep it in mind. Uh, and uh, usually will be in the discussion with the patient and other uh, multidisciplinary uh, uh, team. Uh, some centers, they use it more than others. And I will ask Dr. Uh, Steff, uh, Professor Stiffel after we finish to, to, to give us a little bit uh, what they do in, in, uh, over in their center. So this, patient, uh, this study, which is really a, a nice study, looking at uh, uh, benefit of low dose, uh, uh, which like half dose uh, 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 thrombolytic therapy, uh, as you see, uh, it really showed after 28 uh, months that uh, there was no significant increase, no bleeding whatsoever, but there was significant reduction in pulmonary hypertension, significant reduction in the composite of pulmonary hypertension and recurrent PE, uh, there was also trend towards uh, reduction on mortality, uh, but it didn't reach statistical uh, significance. As, uh, as we also mentioned, uh, there was no bleeding, uh, uh, none, not even one. Uh, the study was about 121 patient, half-half, randomized half-half. Uh, so this is something to consider. Uh, although there is no, uh, uh, you know, much data uh, regarding submassive, but in some cases uh, maybe uh, needs to be considered. The reason I mention it also because we have a case recently similar to our patient, exactly the same patient where she had uh, after pregnancy, she's young lady, she came with right ventricular dysfunction. She had elevated BP, uh, troponin, BMP, uh, blood pressure was not really reaching less than 90 to call it uh, 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 and stable, uh, and that patient was treated with anticoagulation, but she came after three months, unfortunately, with uh, still shortness of breath, still uh, too much symptoms, decreased quality of life, and also uh, later on diagnosed with CTIF. So, so we'll 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 have some discussion with Professor uh, Stefal if this is something to really uh, consider and solve for those patients. So this patient, uh, part of the workup, we needed to be sure it's not antiphospholipid syndrome and few other uh, uh, hypercoagulable workup, although it's really controversial to do it in the acute level uh, uh, state, but it was negative. So, so also this is uh, uh, shown by Professor uh, uh, Stefal. Basically this patient, when, uh, when she will come back after three and six months, uh, evaluated. This lady, basically, although it's a, what looks like triggered by pregnancy, she's in the intermediate uh, uh, group where every year she has 3 to 8% uh, risk of recurrence if we stop the anticoagulation. Uh, and uh, this is where now, uh, uh, as Professor said, there is a lot of change uh, in the management and we're, we're extending uh, uh, some patient uh, anticoagulation uh, in this group more than what we used to do 15 years ago for the sake of uh, the patient. But this is, will be all case by case and also uh, discussion with the patient in uh, uh, understanding the risk and benefit. And of course, this is for patient with uh, low risk of a bleed or low to moderate, high risk of bleed usually will stop at three months. And again, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll talk to uh, Professor Stiffel in such cases, cases like after OT, OCP, pregnancy, what they are doing uh, in their center. Uh, again, I had a patient recently uh, after pregnancy, she had one PE treated for six months. Then after uh, a second pregnancy, she had also another PE. So two, two uh, episodes after pregnancy, 
And again, for that patient, definitely we talk to the patient about the extension for life uh, 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 after discussion about benefit and risk. So again, such patient, uh, nice to consider extended anticoagulation after discussing with the patient and looking at the risk and benefit. I will finish with the uh, last case, which is more like a, a, a thrombosis in a cancer patient. Uh, we had this patient, 45 year old male, presented to our ER with uh, moderate left leg pain and swelling for two days. No chest pain, no dyspnea, no hemoptysis. So it didn't look like he has PE on the top of the DVT. Uh, no recent surgery or immobilization, but the patient had history of hypertension and lung cancer, uh, taking chemotherapy. Uh, no previous VTE, no family history of VTE. Uh, patient had uh, stable vitals. Uh, but his left leg was really uh, huge, uh, the whole leg from the side down to the foot uh, with uh, uh, tenderness on the left side. So if we do the well score for this patient, it comes very high. So we didn't even bother with the D-dimer as recommended, and we went for the Doppler. And this patient had really extensive uh, thrombosis uh, going from the left external iliac down to the uh, popular teal. So, uh, uh, so it was very, very expense, uh, extensive. So again, uh, this patient basically, uh, uh, initially we admitted the patient, we started him again on uh, uh, enoxaparin, uh, as we said, because it's very ex ex uh, extensive. Uh, we had the discussion uh, among ourselves and with the patient and with our inter uh, interventional radiologist, uh, to see if he will benefit of uh, uh, catheter-directed thromb uh, thrombolysis, uh, although it's, uh, it's not really uh, recommended for everybody, but this is list of some of the uh, uh, criteria where to consider. And this patient uh, elected to wait for a couple of days before we uh, do it, and the uh, patient got better with enoxaparin, and he elected uh, not to go for the uh, CDT. So uh, uh, this patient, as we see usually uh, common in uh, uh, patient living with cancer, those are some of the highest risk for VTE. Everybody with cancer has a high risk of VTE, but those are the highest one. And you can see he has two of them. He has lung cancer and he's uh, on cisplatin for his uh, 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 chemotherapy. So again, uh, all the guidelines nowadays uh, 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 recommend uh, NUAC for, for patients with non-GI uh, cancer, active cancer. Uh, and there is, uh, you know, usually the way we do it, we look at the bleeding risk of the patient. Uh, we look at the type of the cancer, mainly GI versus other. We look at drug-drug interaction like in this patient. Uh, and also we put all the uh, recommendation and talk to the patient. Uh, to get his preference because we have the option of the low molecular versus NOAC uh, uh, and uh, uh, patient usually prefer oral medication. So this patient, we did the same uh, after uh, treating him initially for a couple of days, uh, two to three days with enoxaparin. Uh, uh, he started getting better and the decision was to, uh, we switch him to, uh, like decision was to continue enoxaparin for at least five days and uh, discharge him on reduxaparin. Uh, and again, you see it in the NCCN guidelines. Uh, you see it in also in the uh, ACCO uh, uh, guidelines. Uh, and you can see uh, uh, edoxapan uh, from the beginning, even from 2018 and 19, it was category one. Uh, and the newest one, uh, abixaban pumped up to category one. Rivaroxaban category 2A, uh, and also same in the other guidelines. Uh, so with this, uh, I will finish my cases and open for any discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Tarak, for your uh, informative lecture. Um, I would uh, Probably we would start if there is any discussion among the speakers, and then we will move to the Q&A part. So I will ask uh, uh, Professor a uh, couple of things about those cases. Uh, 
So what's uh, what do you like? I mean, because this is really controversial, and in our area, uh, some of the hospital really go with the low dose for some cases. Uh, like a Cleveland clinic, I think they are doing it much more. I'm not sure in the other hospital. Uh, but we did it for a few patients in our hospital. We did it for one case where the pulmonary blood pressure was 70 and on discharge back to 25. Uh, and again, just to prevent hopefully CTIF and prevent uh, uh, complication, as what I mentioned with the other lady uh, after pregnancy who developed CTIF after three months. And also for the catheter-directed uh, thrombosis, uh, uh, if you agree or disagree with uh, uh, what we mentioned. Yes, well, I, you know what, I think this is, like you said, it's, it's absolutely correct. It, it's, a, um, it's, it's a controversial area, but I do think that uh, by the time we do have some data now indicating that um, this may be useful in patients that are intermediate risk and on their way to decompensation. So I think for a general recommendation, intermediate risk patients, we do not have enough data. We also have the PATO trial, um, we, which came out, I think, a year or so after the MOPED, uh, which was over, over a thousand patients, right? And which did not show a benefit. Um, it, it did show, like the MOPED, it showed, and in your patients showed is the, the hemodynamic improvement, but at the cost of bleeding and even stroke. So in, in, in general, I would not recommend it. But like you said, like I also mentioned before, I think it is critical to keep these patients in-house and to keep an eye on them. And if you're talking about the one that is really going down with their systolic blood pressure to 70, and I think the dynamics are even more important than the actual figures, right? If she's really going down and you see that what you're doing is not enough, I think then this is definitely something that, uh, that can and should be considered. And um, of course, if you have the possibility of catheter-directed thrombolysis, then that's a good thing. Um, you, you will most likely reduce the risk of, uh, of side effects. It, of course, it requires a specialized team and specialized setups, but, um, but this is clearly something that has also been shown to be quite useful. And new uh, technologies are on their way uh, through clinical trials right now. So we'll, uh, we'll be very interested to see how that, uh, how that will then pan out. So, I mean, the ganding, because sometimes we depend uh, on the blood pressure as a criteria, like less than 90. So, mm -hmm. like, we have some patient who is really sick and their blood pressure 95. But in reality, we don't know their really normal blood pressure. And if somebody coming from, like, 150 to 95 uh, is, is as severe as if somebody coming from 120 to less than 90. So, this is where, really, the criteria... Uh, uh, comes where, like, if we go by a specific just number, uh, we might really miss some cases where it might cause them trouble down the road also. You know, I, I fully agree. And again, um, the dynamics, are, I, think, I think, are very important. And on the other hand, we should also, of course, not rely on blood pressure alone. I mean, there are other uh, parameters that we can take into consideration. Um, biomarkers, uh, troponin, antiprobian P, as we indicated, also echo. And I think these patients are really, these are the types of patients that need to be closely monitored in whom it is also not a, a, luxu a luxury situation to order an echo in the middle of the night, because if you feel that this patient is uh, running into right heart failure, uh, you need to know because it does have some direct implications because then yes, you would take that patient even with a normal or with a supra 90 millimeters systolic blood pressure uh, to lysis. Yeah, and it's uh, as in the algorithm of the ACS also, like, you know, those patients with elevated troponin, they have that considered. So like, you know, uh, so it's also, uh, it's put in the uh, guide. What about those patients after OCP and pregnancy? If it's like one episode or if it's two episodes, uh, what, what uh, do you recommend for extension? Because still, I think the majority of the physician who's not dealing too much with anticoagulation, really they are shy or hesitant to go extended. Yeah, you know, I think it's, it, this is in the direction of, um, 
uh, of of the, the the whole discussion about provoked versus unprovoked DVT, right? And what is a major, what is a non-major risk factor? I think you know we see uh, every week, every month, we see hundreds of pregnancies, hundreds of people or women that give birth, and the vast majority doesn't develop a PE. So that it's like the people that go on a plane, you know, somebody that has a PE after a flight from uh, Dubai to New York City. I mean, you know, uh, the other 400 people do not have a PE. So there is something about that patient that makes that patient special. And uh, most of the times, this is a two hit thing, right? Um, the, the flight alone is not enough, at least not in the 400 other passengers. And the, the whatever defect it may be, whatever thrombophilia it may be, is usually also not enough. It does require the flight, the additional risk factor. And so I am, uh, because of course, we're, we're dealing usually with young women. So um, the, 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 the lifetime burden that this would imply, of course, is, is substantial. Um, but I would really shy away from just simply saying, oh, this is secondary, we'll stop after three months and she'll be fine. I mean, the postpartum drags on longer than just three months, especially if, if she's also breastfeeding at the same time still. We we're, we're still have a hormonal uh, situation that is not normal. And um, so definitely I would continue uh, there, thereafter. Uh, mostly low molecular weight, of course, uh, especially if she's breastfeeding, that obviously is a contraindication to, to, uh, to NOAC therapy. But um, and then thereafter, I I usually recommend a full coagulation workup in these patients prior to making a decision. I think this is really you know I mean in terms of life year potential life years lost if something again happens and she's not as as lucky in quote unquote um, to only have a PE and then survive it. I think it, it's totally worth it. And just to mention, this patient basically she's not lactating. That's the reason we give the edoxibrine. So, so fair enough, yeah. fair enough. No, that's Thank a, you. But I think it's an important point to make. And like you said, I mean, sure. pregnancy as well as breastfeeding is certainly pregnancy because these molecules are very small. They do cross the uh, placenta barrier, and they can also be found in breast milk. Although it's of course it's not the same concentration as in in the fetal circulation, but it's still a situation where it's uh, where it's contraindicated. So if you do treat these patients don't those are the amongst the patients that should not be treated with an eye thank you i took a uh, long time from the question <laughs> no but i think these are important and good questions okay thank you very much for the informative discussion and i think we will pick some of the questions we've got a big number of questions here so we'll pick some of them uh, the first one, it's, I mean, which is recurring, it's about the use of doxaban on patients with high creatinine level or end-stage renal uh, disease. Yes. So, so what about the use? Yeah. So this was an this was an issue, and I'm explicitly saying was an issue in the early phase with the doxaban, and it stems from a post hoc analysis of the FDA that has kind of sliced and diced these data into deciles of renal function. And that's not for VTE, by the way, but for AFib. This was in the AFib trial, so in the Engage AF trial. And there it was seen that towards the very high creatinine clearance values, um, there was a signal that there might be an increased risk for stroke, ischemic stroke with edoxaban as compared to warfarin. However, that was not due to the fact that the risk of edoxaban went up. It was more because the risk with warfarin went down very low and much lower than we had seen in any other trial. Since then, we've had a lot more experience. Since then, also, by the way, the data with apixaban and with rivaroxaban have been reviewed. And there was a very similar finding, also very small finding, uh, similar to that of edoxaban. For all practical purposes, and we also write this in our ERA guide, it probably doesn't matter. Uh, these are the lowest risk patients you can think of. If you find a patient with a creatinine clearance of more than 90, um, it probably doesn't matter how you treat them with which NOAC. This is why also in our ERA guide, we have removed this yellow arrow for the supranormal renal function. Um, and, and we can use edoxaban as much as we can use the other NOACs. On the other side of the spectrum, we have to admit that we have absolutely no idea. 
We have no idea what to use in end-stage renal or on dialysis. There were just now two trials presented at AHA and also published at the same time. Well, one was presented, I think, two years ago and is now finally published, the renal AF, which was prematurely terminated with the Pixaban, and the Exadia trial also with the Pixaban. Um, and, and both uh, did not show any difference from Pixaban to warfarin in dialysis patients. So no benefit. Um, also, no, well, no, at least no significant sign of, of a problem. But I think the time is too early to just say we can use a Pixaban, Edoxaban, or whatever other NOAC, certainly not the bigger trend in, uh, on dialysis. Now, um, the, the bigger question is what do we do on dialysis? Because we actually have no clue at all, uh, because there are also absolutely no data with warfarin on dialysis, right? There's not a single randomized trial. There are registries, but um, we need to be very careful with those, as we found out multiple times in the past. Personally, uh, I make this a very individualized decision. I take a look at this with the nephrologist, with the internist, the primary care, with the patient, of course, primarily. And then half of my patients actually end up without anticoagulation. First stroke prevention, AFib. In, in, for a VTE, of course, it's a different story. You need to treat these patients, uh, mostly then with heparin um, or low molecular weight heparin. But for stroke prevention, half of my patients actually end up without anticoagulation. We have no data, unfortunately. It's really a shame because it's it's not a small patient population. Okay. Thank you, doctor. Uh, there is another question here. I mean, I had it also on several occasions uh, asking, uh, should we bridge with low molecular uh, weight heparin uh, in case of pulmonary embolism and the use of adexaban, or could we skip that uh, bridging uh, period? I think, uh, as we already mentioned, basically the study was uh, done that way. And also, as we mentioned, you know, the majority of PE patients, we have to be careful uh, because they might get worse. So that's a reason it's really recommended uh, to start with a, a heparin or enoxaparin or low molecular, then later on switch. Uh, so, so it's by labels and so on really needs to be done by five days and whatever. Is not because like adoxaban doesn't not, does not work right away, but because as we said, the study was done this way, and also we see benefit of uh, heparin, low molecular heparin for those patients, especially in the first uh, few days. And professors, yes, no, I I, I agree. I, I think the question is more: um, should we really start with the pixaban or roxaban directly in all patients with a PE, right? And I would not recommend that. I would clearly not recommend that. I think it's uh, it's something for for in low risk situations. And to be very honest with you, now this is fully off label, but in in low risk situations, I've also started edoxaban directly. Um, but I think that the flip side is the more important one because again, in the low risk patients probably doesn't matter so much. But in the intermediate to high-risk patients, I would not start a pixaban. I would not start a roxaban directly up front. I would always go with heparin. Okay, um, we'll go to another question here. Uh, um, what is the recommended anticoagulation in case of a deep vein thrombosis in a patient with GI AV malformation or extensive uh, colonic diverticular disease? You want to go or uh, basically? No, go, go, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> okay, that's fine. So uh, we know, uh, you know, such patients, they are at high risk regardless of what we give, uh, either warfarin or uh, heparin or NUAC, uh, because if they will bleed, they will bleed. So so really those the cases are the exceptional one where uh, we have to look at each patient individually, look at the other uh, comorbidities and so on then make a decision pay case by case. I mean, uh, usually uh, if no active bleeding at this time, uh, I think um, in my practice, we usually, we give them uh, a treatment, but we tell, educate them and we observe closely. If they keep getting, you know, bleeding and significant, then sometimes we might need to uh, 
uh, consider filter or whatever. Yeah, I would, I would agree. I would agree. I would probably, whenever there's something in the GI, I would go for heparin, low molecular weight heparin, because of the active ingredient passing by a potential lesion. Um, but but uh, it's a different situation uh, than in, uh, in the AFib. You need to treat these patients, right? It's a treatment. It's not a prevention. So uh, even in AFib, we usually treat them and see if we can re-expose. But in this situation, definitely, there's no way around it, really. Yeah, because filter is not yeah. always a solution. It can no. cause, uh, it can be a reason for uh, clot above the filter sometimes. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, I think that's so, really a bailout, bailout if there's no other option. Yeah. Um, there is uh, another question here. Uh, it's it's just like a patient with PE setting and uh, having thrombocytopenia of uh, platelets of thirty. Um, how would we anticoagulate such a patient? Again, a difficult situation. I think it depends really. Um, again. Different situations, stroke prevention in AFib versus somebody who has a DVT. So if you have somebody with 30,000 platelet that actually makes a DVT or a pulmonary embolism, then those platelets need to be quite active um, and as because otherwise they wouldn't form a clot. So I would still in this situation treat the patient because if they have survived this first PE, uh, what they will die from is their second. And if we don't treat them, there is a good chance that there will be a second and uh, then there will be a problem. So I would treat these patients. Um, usually anything about, above 50,000, we would treat anyways. Um, but I think it is very important to not only look at the number, also look at the dynamics. If that patient came down from 150 to 30, there's a chance that this is hit. Right, so that we we need to look after those things, and then we need to look after other pathologies, uh, and to to explain why we have that low count. If it's idiopathic, it's a completely different situation than in a hit or in somebody with myelodysplastic syndrome, for example. Doctor Dari. Yeah, I, I agree. Basically, I think it's very important to know is this acute or or chronic. Uh, in acute cases, after we rule out, be sure like there is no hit, of course. Uh, sometimes we might, if we believe that like, giving platelet will raise above 50, sometimes in acute case, we can do a platelet transfusion, and then we will start with enoxaparin and later on uh, to get them to different uh, long-term anticoagulation. If it's a chronic, then usually when we use enoxaparin less than 50, we use half of the dose down to the 20. So again, it's not in the guidelines, but there is good algorithm uh, up, you know, regarding this. And in such cases, hopefully we can really try to go uh, to some other uh, anticoagulation if the issue about uh, heparin or low molecular heparin. Uh, okay. Here is a question. If a patient is on antiplatelets or aspirin, uh, is there any recommendation with the DOAX? Mm -hmm. Yes, so it depends on why the patient is on an antiplatelet agent. If this patient has had um, a coronary event, so an acute myocardial infarction or a stent placement within the last one year, then we need to double check and see how long it has been if we need to continue this. However, if the patient is, has had their event um, more than a year ago, or if this is a primary prevention type setting for coronary artery disease, then it's important to stop the aspirin and just go with NOAC as a monotherapy. We know that NOAC as monotherapy works uh, also in chronic coronary syndromes, what we used to refer to as stable coronary artery disease. So if we add an antiplatelet in that situation, it will only increase the risk of bleeding. It will not help in terms of efficacy, also not on the coronary side. So that's the differentiation. Shortly after ACS or stenting may continue, maybe switch to P2Y12 inhibitor. But most of the times this has been long after they're on chronic aspirin therapy and then or primary prevention, and then it needs to be stopped.
يعني this is for atrial fibrillation I think for VTE basically it's I think you know uh, even if the patient as the professor said and they are on uh, for secondary prevention or whatever then I think it needs to be you know continue and we still we treat uh, with with NOAC or any other anticoagulation for VTE but we have to be careful uh, because the risk of bleed is a little bit more so we have to educate the patient and and go from there okay okay i think we still have lots of questions we'll take like two or of them a couple of them and then we will inshallah end here uh, there is a question here which says that um, if there is a patient with a strong family history of VTE and who is a heterozygous for factor five Leiden uh, and the uh, MTHFR gene mutation, uh, do you recommend NUAX for life? And what is the dose uh, you would use? Okay. So, I mean, basically the only really uh, uh, reason contraindication to use uh, NUAC uh, is the antiphospholipid syndrome and in particular the positive three titer, uh, even in some cases. But in general, the, the guidelines and so on, they say antiphospholipid is better to go with warfarin. But any other hypercoagulable uh, uh, issue uh, is fine to go uh, with NUAC. And of course, reevaluate if there is any failure or whatever, then sometimes we have to go to, uh, to different category. Uh, the dosage usually, I think if we're talking about the extension for reduced dose, which usually like in rivaroxaban and abixaban, after we go with the primary treatment, sometimes we can go to the 10 milligram rivaroxaban, 2.5 BID for abixaban. Uh, usually in high risk patient, uh, uh, is not recommended to go with a reduced dose, uh, but for everybody else is yes. But for those cases where high risk, uh, then it's better to stick with the high dose. Okay, so I think also your question, to Tarak, uh, your answer to Tarak will answer the other question here. Can we use it in hereditary coagulopathy, uh, such as factor five and antithrombin three? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, let me see if there's. I think we had enough uh, of those uh, of the questions. We still have plenty of them, but I don't think that we have time uh, to answer them all, unfortunately. And I think we'll come to a conclusion. And I would like to thank uh, both our eminent speakers for this informative uh, evening. Thank you very much, Dr. Tark. Thank you very much, Dr. Steffel, for uh, the lecture. And um, we will conclude here. And thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you, Dr. Samuel. Thank you for having us. Take care. Bye-bye.